to do a real brief recap on uh, what we talked about in the first session, which is basically just how to prep a piece of furniture for painting. Most of um, the furniture that we're going to have today is going to have uh, a lacquer finish on it. And they do that because lacquer dries fast and uh, it goes on quickly and it goes on evenly. Um, and they can just move right along with the production of it. Uh, if you have a piece of furniture that's lacquered, this is denatured alcohol. And the denatured alcohol, um, if it's lacquer, the denatured alcohol will make it feel sticky. If I rub that on there, you can see that you can see my finger is kind of kind of dragging. That means that this is a lacquer finish. And in order to clean that, I'll wipe it down real good with this denatured alcohol. First, I'll sand it, and I use about a 320 grit sandpaper. I did that earlier, so I don't, I'm not going to waste time doing that right now. But you can see what that alcohol took off. Um, so that it's, it's taking a little bit of the finish off, but it's also making it dull so that when I put paint over it, the, um, the paint will uh, adhere well to it. So the denatured alcohol kind of uh, makes it, the original finish grab is what it does. So I can, I, I would clean this whole thing and like say, you can see what's coming off on there. So you can tell that it's actually doing something and it'll look a little bit hazy after you do this but so that's and i started that on the top on this last this stool the last time and uh we painted it we painted it navy blue and unfortunately i have used that paint and i can't find it anywhere so <laughs> we're not going to do the navy blue today but i wanted to um to do that and i uh, also wanted to show you um let's see I wanted to show you some tools that we would use for um, painting things like the spindles on here and these smaller areas. And some of the things that I use are artist brushes. Um, these are called Simply Simmons artist brushes. You can get them like three for $10 at Michael's places like that, and there, there really are nice brushes for doing small work. Um, so I use all these sort of small brushes when I'm doing a small area, and furniture has so many little nooks and crannies and things. Um, so this, this stool is now going to become black. So. Cup or something I can pour this into. I'll just use the lid. I don't know why. I'm just going to use the, the paint out of the lid on this. But if I were going to paint these spindles, you, you really want to go with the grain of the wood, um, but you can't always do that. So what, what I do is I start to get off in all the little nooks and crannies and things, and then I come back and I go with the grain of the wood after I get the paint on. So I just, I'm just sort of doing a, um, a second brushing of it just so that it, um, so it goes with the grain of the wood. Um, always, when you're painting a wood piece, always go with the grain of the wood and always make sure that you're going in the same direction um, on every section of the um of the piece like if i were to to come here i would go down like this just to get in that corner but then i i start at the, the beginning and i go across like that so that i'm going with the grain of the wood now as you'll see and last time um i told this but i'll, I'll explain it again Let me get a different brush um so last time i explained that how, how to brush paint on. And it's not, you don't, you don't, I'm gonna show it on here, you don't do this. You don't go back and forth like that when you're, when you're brushing onto a piece of furniture. You go in one direction, <clears throat> then you come back into that wet paint. And, and that will do two things. It'll help get rid of your brush marks. But it also, if, if I were to go back into this right now, it would, um, it would pick up the paint that I've already put down and leave a blank spot there. So I don't want to do that. So I'll start at one end 
and then I brush back into it from the opposite. So that's that's pretty much how uh, what what the brush strokes are for doing a piece of furniture. And like say, if if I were to get down in here to these little uh, areas where the spindles are and that sort of thing, I would use a smaller brush for that. But that that sort of explains just the basics of of how to brush on paint. Yeah, um, I have a question, please. Sure. Why don't you just turn the table over so you can get to the legs more easily? Uh, sometimes I do, and most most of the time I will. If it's a big piece of furniture, it's impossible to do that. Sure. Um, but for something like this, it would be easy to do. Um, I usually demonstrate with it upright because most of us, if we're working on um, like, you know, a dresser or something like that, you're not going to have the opportunity to turn it over. Okay. So usually just, you know, usually just show. Yeah. Show it it seems like you have to, of course, it's because you're showing it to us, but it seems like you have to be a contortionist otherwise. Uh, well, you can also put it up onto a bench or a table. Mm -hmm. To work on True. It. You okay. Work okay. On. Thank you. Yeah. Um, not, you know, if you're working on a small piece, you can elevate it. That, that's not, not a problem. All, not all of us can get down in that position that you're in. That's right. You know, if you, have, <laughs> if you have a table or a workbench or something like that, you know, that's that's the best place to do something small like this. Um, Excuse me, Mary Ann. Sometimes I do Excuse have to be a contortionist. <laughs> if, can you make me have the whole page? What's that? She is the full page. Not on my, oh, I guess it's just my computer that mine. Well, no, Steve, Steve, Sean, he's not. He, 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 I'll pick okay, that's cool. okay, then it's just me, excuse me. Well, she needs, she can just get out of gallery view. Yeah, you're probably in gallery view, Martha. You just need to go to speaker view. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. um, now sometimes um, you'll be working on a piece, maybe maybe I put a, a coat of paint on something and, and I, I want to make sure that if I were going to do like something decorative on here, I want to make sure that I have um, a nice sharp edge. If I were to say, if I were going to do a triangle on the top of this piece, I would put my tape on there. Um, this is frog tape, and I have some somewhere to show you. This is frog tape, and frog tape has a little bit of a chemical along the edge that when it gets wet, it absorbs whatever catches on it, so it'll give you a nice straight flat edge. It won't, it won't bleed under like a lot of tapes do. And this is the tape not to use for painting furniture. Deb, Steve, Steve, you need to pay attention to the camera, please. Deb, uh -huh. could you tape again the tape package? The tape package is yeah, right. yeah. And the one I use. Oh, tape. Okay, thank you. The one I use is the the one that's yellow. Um, the yellow one um, is is for sensitive surfaces, so it won't pull paint back off. Uh, like some of them do. There's one that's, that's in a green container, and the green one is real sticky. That's that's good for heavy duty things. You know, if you were taping off like concrete or something like that, it would it would give you a sharp edge. But I always use the yellow one. This is the tape not to use. This blue painter's tape that everybody thinks is the best to use. This tape has um, a crepey texture to it. And paint can bleed under this very easily. Um, if this is all you have, the best way to use this tape is if you put it down, um, whatever color you have as the base, paint along the edge of that tape before you paint another color over it. And then the original <coughs> color will bleed up, and the new color will not. So you can use, and you can see this. Um, I didn't, I didn't prime this piece before I did it, but I just pulled a little bit of paint off with this tape that shows you how sticky it is. I'm pulling off this yellow tape and no paint came off. So that, that's a good, good example of what, what to do and not to do where tape is concerned. Deb, does the frog tape work equally well with, um, with uh, oil-based paint or water-based paint as yeah. far as the, the chemical on the edge? 
Yes, uh huh. It, it works. It, it, it's a real, um, a very thin tape, uh, so it doesn't, you know, doesn't have little ripples along the edge or anything. It's very smooth, and and the whatever gets under it, no matter what, um, whether it's oil based or latex based, um, it, it won't bleed through. Um, you do have to make sure that you push it down really good. And I usually, what I usually do with my tape <clears throat> is I wrap a cloth around my finger and run it along the edge of the tape. Um, and that way I, I make sure that the, that the edge is down tight and, uh, and it helps stop the bleed. So, all Excuse right. me, Deb. Uh-huh. Hi, um, would you use that tape, for when, the frog tape, for like when you're painting a wall? I would. I do. You do? You use it? Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Um, this, this blue tape, you stand more of a chance yes. of pulling um, paint off of the wall if it hasn't been adhered well. Um, like maybe, uh. maybe somebody... Um, you know, they did drywall and they didn't prime it well underneath and the latex will pull off and you stand let me stand. More chance of pulling off a whole bunch of drywall with this blue tape just because it, it's really sticky and uh, it's, it's not made for what, what they call sensitive surfaces. Okay, thank you. Thunder, we have thunder. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's basically the, the prep kind of thing that I wanted to explain to you. Uh, today I was going to concentrate a little bit on um, glazing, which is adding sort of a decorative finish to a painted piece. Uh, you can see in this sample, I don't know if you can see it very well, you can see that there are four, well there are four sections on there, you can probably see two of them, um, where this is the original color down the center, and then I did what's called a glaze over top where, and a glaze is, um, it's like a translucent material that dries transparent, but you add color to it. And there are different types of glazes that you can use. Um, there are a number of products that you can purchase online. Um, I would not use unless you, you really have to. I would not use the products that you can buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, those, those glazes are meant to be used with latex paint, which is regular wall paint. And it makes, um, it makes whatever you're glazing uh, very heavy looking. And uh, those paints have a lot of pigment in them. So the pigment is going to be even more, it's gonna take away the translucency. So your glaze will not, um, dry as translucent, so you won't see the background color as much if you use those glazes. Some of the ones that, that I use that I can recommend, um, this is something you can buy at, at either Lowe's or Home Depot, I believe. It's called Floetrol, and this is, it's basically, um, it's basically like paint without the pigment in it. Um, you can also add this to paint if you want paint to level more nicely and get rid of brush strokes. Um, this is like, like a glaze, you can use that. I use products by a company called Golden. They've changed the name of this now. Um, the, the new name of this one is uh, Sheer Glazing um, Medium. And you order that online and it's by a company called Golden, and it's goldenpaints.com, goldenpaintworks.com. This is my favorite, and this one is meant to be used with what they call universal colorants. Universal colorants would be um, anything like an artist color, or uh, you know what they what they put into your paint to make it a color. That's a universal colorant. Um, but but these kind of um, artist acrylics can work. Um, you can buy little Liquitex things, but you add that to the glaze, and then you, can, you have a translucent color that you can put over top of a base color. Uh, you can also, let's see, what else do I want to tell you? Uh, let's see, Fusion Mineral Paint. Um, I use Fusion Mineral Paint quite often for furniture. It's, um, it's better than chalk paint. Chalk paint creates, you can't do a lot with chalk paint as far as um, adding any decorative you know, finishes to it or anything. It's really hard to do that with chalk paint because chalk paint is very absorbent. 
you can imagine because it has chalk in it. So it, it's, it's a thick paint. Uh, that's why it covers so well. But, it, but it's also very, um, very viscous. It has a lot of viscosity to it. Uh, I like this Fusion Mineral paint. It goes on easily. It dries nicely. It does not absolutely have to be top coated. But um, anytime you do a glaze over top of any paint finish, you do need to top coat it because glazes are not permanent. They can be reactivated. So you don't want to leave anything that you're glazing. You will always want to top coat it. And in a minute, I'll talk about the top coats. But um, I use Fusion Mineral Paint. I use uh, General Finishes products. General Finishes also makes a glaze that goes with their paints, but there again, you're using a latex color over top of a latex color, and you're not gonna get as um, translucent a finish, and it won't. Uh, to me, it doesn't level as nicely, and it doesn't look as professional as using the artist's acrylic glazes. Um, there's another company that you can order online. This is another one. Um, when, when you're doing things like I do, like wood graining and marbling and that sort of thing, um, you want what's called open time. It gives you the opportunity to move the paint around longer. Um, this company is called Polyvine, and they're based in England, but there are a lot of people who, uh, who are called stockists who sell it in the United States. Um, but this polyvine has what's called a very long open time. Uh, the golden paint also has a long open, the golden paint glaze also has a long open time. Uh, the, the, the nice thing about this is if you put a glaze on and you, you say, oh man, I, I botched that one up, you know, I got my finger in it or something, you still have the opportunity to go back and fix it. So I like having the long open time. And this is another one that you can order online. Um, polyvine.com and this one they make two versions as well they make this one which is called scumble glaze and this one is meant to be used with the universal colorants which would be like artist acrylics and then they make one that's called um, scumble classic color and that one is meant to be used with latex paints so there are options. Um, Lowe's also makes one by, um, or Lowe's sells one by Valspar. And that one too is made only for using with latex paint. If you use a glaze that's made for latex paint with these artist acrylics, it will never cure. Um, there's something in the glaze that's made um, for the universal colorants that, that makes it harden. The glaze that you use with latex paint relies on the, whatever um, chemicals are in here to make it harden up. So you can't use um, a glaze that's meant for latex paint with the universal colorant. So there's a, there's a distinction there. Um, there's another one that you can get online that, that is made in Texas. It's called Design 7 Glaze. I use this one a lot if I'm doing wall finishes. Um, because it comes in gallons and it, um, it goes on nicely. I've, I've done um, what they call an ombre wall where you start with the darker color and it works down to a lighter color or vice versa. And, and this I can thin it out with the latex paint to the point where it gets really translucent. As you can see this is, um, it, it moves around easily so it's not real thick and I like that one too. Yeah. And before I go any further, I wanted to show you there are a couple things that are really good for cleaning your tools before we get into actually using the tools. Um, a couple of things that are really good for cleaning the tools. I always clean my brushes with Murphy's oil soap. If you have a hardened brush, this Murphy's oil soap, you can soak it in this overnight and then you can use a wire brush or um, you know, some sort of a tooth, a old comb or something like that. And this will take that hardened paint out. Murphy's oil soap is the best thing ever for brushes. And uh, my favorite cleaner to use for sort of general purpose cleaner is Simple Green. It's, um, it's environmentally friendly. It doesn't have any harsh chemicals in it. But, um, and it's a really good degreaser if you were gonna clean like uh, kitchen cabinets or something. The Simple Green works really well for degreasing. 
So uh, keep those two in mind if you're if you're ever in, in paint mood, you can uh, have something reliable to clean your, uh, your, your tools with. Let's see, and one other thing I wanted to mention, um, a lot of times you'll have a piece of furniture and maybe it has a dent in it or something and you want to fix that. Um, there are lots of wood fillers uh, on the market. Most of those wood fillers are made, are technically made for filling raw wood. They're not really made for filling um, a finished piece of furniture. They have sawdust in them, so they're gonna have um, sort of a texture to them, and they're very absorbent, so you have to be careful with those. Um, what I like to use is this um, Durham's Water Putty, and you just mix it with water. It's sandable. After it dries, it dries completely smooth. You just paint right over it, and um, it's not absorbent at all, so you, you don't have to worry about what they call flashing. Um, if you put uh, some kind of a filler and you just paint over it, sometimes it'll flash. Sometimes it requires priming before you paint over it. But this, you can just paint right over this and it doesn't, um, it won't flash. And this is really good. It says it sticks, it stays put, it will not shrink. So this is really good for making, uh, for filling in holes and things. All right. So I think we're ready to get into the glazing part. We have any questions so far? Okay, so last night I painted um, a piece of wood that, that I had done for a sample for someone. Now these products that I used for this glaze are, um, they're, they're professional grade products and I'm, I'm just going to show you how this works. I'm going to do it on one section of it so that you can see what these products do. And then I'll mix up a glaze with the artist colors so you can see how that works. I'm just stirring this up because after a while the, the pigment um, sinks to the bottom. So you have to make sure you stir things up well. And I have to do that when I'm working on a big project. I have to stir it occasionally so because the uh, the pigment will stick, uh, sink to the bottom. Now there are a couple ways. Excuse me. Uh huh. Excuse me, Deb. I'm sorry, it's Tammy. How do you decide what type of paint you're going to use, like latex or um, non-latex, or um, if, if, I'm, if I'm going to glaze, need to go with the same type of paint. Um, if I'm going to paint a piece of furniture, I'm I'm going to use a paint that's specifically made for furniture. Um, which would be, you know, like for example, would be the Fusion or it would be the General Finishes. I also use Benjamin Moore Advance paint, which is um, actually made for cabinetry. The only, the only disadvantage to the Advance paint is um, it requires 16 hours between coats. You have to let it dry for 16 hours before you can put a second coat on, but this also does what they call level nicely, so you, it doesn't leave you brush strokes. If you were to use just plain old latex paint, um, it dries so fast that, that the brush strokes don't have time to sink down. The brush strokes will stay raised. So when you see, um, you know, if you use regular latex paint on this, you would see all the brush strokes. Um, this advanced levels nicely. Um, the fusion mineral paint levels nicely, and general finishes also levels nicely. They're actually made for that. Now, if you were going to glaze over top of any of those, if you're going to glaze over top of any of those, I would invest in in a good glaze um, and not use the latex glaze. I would use the glaze that's meant for the universal colorings because it's going to give you a finer finish. Okay, so I'm going to, Thank you. Mm -hmm, I'm going to do a little bit on this, um, and then I'll show you, I'll mix up some of the other glaze and show you what that does. So I, what I do is there are two ways that you can do a glaze. One is to apply the glaze, what they call, in a positive manner, and the other is to remove it so you're using a negative finish. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just putting on a whole lot of glaze. And you can see how dark that is. Everybody see how dark that is? So I'm going to do um, a negative finish right now. Oh, I need a pair of scissors. I think there's some there somewhere. 
Oh, here we go. This is fine. Now this is cheesecloth. This is really good for removing paint um, when you're glazing something because it gives you a nice fine, um, a nice like fine strie on there. Um, the other things that are really good, if I was doing a large area, in fact, I helped someone back in um, the early March, I helped someone work on a big project in Bethesda in a condo where we were glazing a whole library full of, of um, built-ins. And we had these big areas to do. We had these big long countertops and we had door sides of the, the, the sides of the built-ins and the doors and all that. So we use this little tool, it's made by Sherline, and it's called a handy painter. And you can see it has like little fine hairs on it. Now if I use that over the top of this glaze, watch what it does. Can you see that? It took the glaze off, but it left this nice strie behind. So that, you know, gives me that real nice glazed look. I don't know if that's visible on the camera or not. Can you see it? Um, now, if I wanted that even a little lighter, what I would do is I would use this cheesecloth. And I, I don't usually do it, um, use the cheesecloth in, in a, a real flat manner. I usually just kind of wide it up like that. And then I can, come in and I can pull even more paint off. But you see that leaves a finer strie and that also, um, and you can also see I'm going in the same direction all the time. I'm not wiping it around. So that gives me an even finer finish. Now this is what we started with and that's what we ended up with. And that's just a, a, a real simple glaze technique. And uh, this is using my, my professional faux effects products. Um, but I wanted to also show you what this other glaze can do. And I'm gonna use the, uh, I'm gonna use the golden. Deb. Uh-huh. Was that negative process or positive? That, that was negative. Okay, so you're wiping it down is in that, is yeah, you're removing product. Well, okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Now, if I were if I were going to do a positive glaze, I would wipe off a whole bunch of the the glaze before I even touch my wood, and I would lightly apply it so that I'm if I'm going to leave it on there, I'm not going to remove it. That's a positive. That's a positive glaze, and um, I'll show you. So I just. I'm just lightly brushing that on. So that's a positive application. Okay. Okay, do we want Prussian blue or turquoise? I think we're gonna do Prussian blue. Now the proportion of paint to glaze is very important. Uh, if you use too much pigment, it's just going to be really opaque. So you want to start with a lower, um, a smaller amount of um, color to glaze. And as you can see, this got really blue really fast. That was just two drops of paint to about two tablespoons of glaze. If I didn't want that to be quite that um, strong looking. I would add a little more glaze to it so that when I put it on the um, over top of the paint, I'm going to get I'm going to get a thinner application. Okay. So can you see that blue? Now I'm applying that with a chip brush, which are the little disposable brushes that you can buy. Now if I were just gonna, if I just wanted to have a sort of a brush effect on that, I can just come in with a dry brush, with a nice dry brush, and I can just go right over top of that. And you can see how that smoothed that out. 
Suppose I don't like that. Because I'm using this glaze, it has a, a long open time. I can just wipe that right off. So you can see that just goes away if I wanted to. Uh, I'm going to do my water spray bottle. If I wanted to take it off completely, maybe I didn't like that color. Then I just use a damp rag and I can just wipe that right off. Now I have to make sure that's dry before I put more glaze on it. Take this brown off too. See this board, I, I, one thing that I can tell you that you shouldn't do that I did is I only put one coat of paint on this board. Always do two coats because it helps to stop the porosity. It helps to make it so that the, the glaze doesn't seep into it as, um, as quickly. So make sure um, before you glaze something, make sure you have two coats of base color underneath it. I was in a hurry last night and I did it that way. So anyway, so I'm gonna put this blue back on. Maybe I wanna add a little bit of black to it to make it more navy blue. Try to get the black to come out. There we go. Not, not cooperating, so we'll use turquoise. Okay, so I'm going to add a little bit more color to this because I want something that's going to show up better on the camera. So we're going to end up with sort of a turquoise green. Okay, so I've applied that. Um, another tool that's really good if you're doing a small area, like sometimes you'll have like the outer edge of the top of a dresser or a leg or something like that. Sherline also makes this little edger tool, which is um, really handy and it's really good for doing small areas and it has those same little hairs on it so you can use that. If you were doing, you know, like a small area, small flat area, it's really, really good for the inside edge of cabinet doors, for painting and for glazing. I use that a lot for that. Um, so I'm just going to brush this and you can see what the brush is doing. See, it's just taken off and, and you always want to dab off some of the paint off of your brush. You don't want to keep using it because it'll just keep putting the paint back on or the glaze back on. So that's what that glaze will do. That um, that will do with the with the brush. Now, if I wanted to um, get a, a even lighter glaze, I would put a little bit of pressure on with my cheesecloth, and I can even pull back more. So that's giving me a nice strie there. So it's not. Um, it's not as intense as that. It, it just sort of lightens it up nicely. Um, and the best thing to do when you're glazing is to make sure that you put plenty on in the beginning. Um, you don't want to you don't want to make it flooded with it, but you want to make sure that it's that it's enough on there that you have some room to pull it back. So if I I were to do that one time and I say oh that's still too dark then I can go back with my cheesecloth and even lighten it up even a little more. So uh, that's, that's the cheesecloth method, which, which I use a whole lot. I use that quite often, um, especially on furniture. Um, it seems like for the last 10 years, I've been painting furniture nonstop. <laughs> um, one, one designer told me that I'm a, I'm a niche artist because there are, are, aren't very many people who can do detective work and find out what, what makes a finish and I'm one of them apparently. So, um, and another thing I wanted to show you, um, I usually wear gloves, but sometimes it's just not convenient to, to wear gloves. 
The best thing for taking paint off of your hands is one of these, it's called Adobe Cleaner. Um, and that'll just take paint right off of your hands. It, it, it's wonderful. I carry these with me everywhere I go when I'm painting. So um, these little Adobe pads are really the, they're the bee's knees when it comes to cleaning up your hands. Okay, anybody have any questions about glazing? I, I do. Is that what you did on that big piece of furniture? Um, I did glazing on that in the in the inside. Uh huh. And you can see it. Um, the the green was um, a little bit darker than that, but this they wanted it to look more like a whitewash. So it was a very thin glaze. It didn't have a lot of pigment in it. That's a lot of work. Thank you. Yeah. On the outside, actually, all the all the base colors. I used three colors on that. It, it started out with the green wow. base color. Then I went over it with an ivory, then I went over it with the white, but all of that is all done with a one inch brush and I brushed on all My of goodness, it. wow. And then, and I, then I did, then I did a, a, another glaze over top of it. I did like a whitewash over top of it to blend it all together. So it was, it was a, quite an undertaking. <laughs> oh, beautiful, thank you. Say hey, Deb, Hi, Deb. I, I noticed that you used a chip brush for some of the work there. Yes. I was wondering what your thoughts are about uh, using more expensive brushes for, for say, finished coats or doing furniture or using a, a cheaper brush. I mean, I usually go cheap, but I know there's some arguments that a better brush is, uh, a more expensive brush is going to give a better finish. Um, the, it depends. It depends on uh, the brush you use a lot depends on what paint you're using. If you're using something that's meant for a fine finish, like some of these furniture paints, you're going to want to use a brush that has very fine, very soft, very movable bristles. Um, this one is, I don't know, this was made by Purdy or, or one of those, but it has a very fine bristle. This is a regular paintbrush. I really don't use these a lot unless I'm doing a big piece of furniture. Um, but the more money you invest in your brushes, um, the, the finer finish you are going to get. Because um, you have to be careful that there are brushes that are made for oil-based paints, there are brushes that are made for latex paints, and then there are brushes that are made for water-based paints, which would include like these furniture paints. Um, and some of them, some of those brushes um, are, they, they have a real um, feathered tip, and that's what you definitely want to use if you're painting furniture. You want a, a brush that has a really fine feathered tip. You don't want to use like a china bristle brush, which is, which is what this is, which is actually hog hair. So you don't want to use something coarse like that. You want to make sure that you use, and, and brushes can last a lifetime if you clean them um, directly after you're painting and sometimes while you're painting if you're painting for a long period of time. I have a decorative painter friend who will use a, use a brush and she'll just leave it, leave the paint in it from the day she's been working and she'll wrap it up in plastic so that she can just use it again the next day. But what happens is the paint that's up here where you're not dipping into the fresh paint will harden so it'll get in these ferrules and eventually what it'll do is it'll make all the bristles separate. So you're basically ruining your brush by leaving paint in it. Now I've had this brush for probably five years and you can see how clean it is because I clean it all the time. <laughs> and I use a wire, I usually use a wire brush and the uh, Murphy's oil soap to clean my brushes. I also use, now this is some, um, this is a pretty expensive brush. This is an artist's brush, it's called a scepter. But you can see that this has really fine bristles, very fine. It, it's a synthetic brush, but it's made to look like uh, sable. So it's really fine. And if I were going to paint, um, you know, the top of this little bench, I would use something with a really fine bristle because I don't want the brush strokes to show. When the light shines on it, I want it to look smooth. So I want to make sure that I, that I use the best brush that I can. Uh, for the project that I'm working on. Um, even, even for primer, I use a good brush to put primer on because your primer, whatever uh, 
doesn't level in the primer is going to show up in your finish coat. So you want to make sure that you use um, you know a good brush for that too. All right. So okay, we're thanks. almost running out of time here. I wanted to show you real quick some options for uh, for adding decorative little little decorative things to your furniture. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? Okay, so one thing you can do, uh, I showed this earlier, one thing you can do if you wanted to add, say, um, a geometric pattern to this little bench, and, and it is a bench, it's not a table, it actually has a seat that raises up. I think it was probably from an organ or something, or vanity or something, but if you wanted to add, say, a geometric shape around the side of this, you know, if I wanted to to do a maybe a glaze in the middle. I would put my tape on. Make sure where's my towel. Make sure that this is adhered down well. Okay, now these are metallic paints. And these actually, you can buy these at Sneeds, at least you could the last time I was there. Um, you can also, um, Rust-Oleum bought this company that makes these paints. This, this is a company called Modern Masters and Rust-Oleum bought that company. So like at Home Depot, they sell metallic paints and they're, they're actually probably the same formulation as this Modern Masters paint. This is actually made for decorative painters, but, um, and this has um, a little bit of um, translucency to it. This one is called semi-opaque. So this one is not real um, thick, so it's not going to show up um, as, as much as an opaque paint would. I'm going to add a little bit of what's called extender to this because I want it to be a little bit more translucent. So I mix that together and I can show you what we would get. Okay, so if I were going to do this, maybe I wanted to do just the center of this whole thing. I wanted to do it with this, with this glaze so that this looked different and I had a border around the edge. So I can go, I can go along right along the edge of that tape. Okay, because I added the extender to it, it's giving me a little more open time. So now I can go back with my cheesecloth and I can get a finer, a finer finish. And the only trouble with the cheesecloth is if you don't have the technique down pat on it, um, you can get a little bit of variation on it. So you want to make sure that you use an even pressure. So that's what I would do if I wanted to do, you know, this maybe the center. And when I remove this tape, you can see the nice sharp edge that I get. Mm, nice. Okay, so. So say I've done this whole center and I decided, oh, I think I'd like a stencil in the middle. Now this, um, this stencil is one I've used before. Um, the only thing with stenciling is you have to make sure, you have to make sure that you uh, don't, you, your paint can't be, you can't have too much paint on your brush when you're stenciling. If you have too much paint on your brush, it's gonna definitely gonna bleed under. I usually use what's called a removable spray adhesive on my stencils, but it depends on the project because sometimes those can leave a little bit of adhesive behind and I, I wouldn't want that on a piece of furniture. Okay, so I'm just taking this down. And I have, what did I do with my brushes? Okay, you can get stencil brushes at Michael's that are foam. They're little foam brushes that work really nicely. You can invest in a really nice bristle 
stencil brush. And the difference with a stencil brush and a regular brush is that stencil brushes are completely flat on the bottom. And they're made for pounding, like pouncing on top of something. So if I were going to pounce that, what I do is I want to make sure that I have it evenly on my brush. But I also want to make sure that I dab it onto a paper towel or a, a you know some sort of terry towel or something first to make sure that I don't have too much paint on there. And I'll dab it to make sure that it's even before I even touch the stencil. And the, the technique for stenciling is to make sure that you're going straight up and down and not have too much paint on your brush. Now you can do stenciling, you can do like a, um, like a variegated kind of look so that it's thinner in some places and the paint's a little heavier in other places. So that's what you get when you do a when you do a stencil. And you know, if I were just I would I would make sure that I measured and had that centered and everything, but for demonstration purposes, um, I, I didn't do that. And as I told you before, when I did this, I was just demonstrating how to do the brush strokes. I didn't prime this first because I wanted to show what to do with the wood, and I didn't have time to wait for the primer to dry. So this this pulled a little bit of the paint off because it didn't adhere well there and that's mainly because I didn't prepare this um, quite as well as I could have if I had actually been doing it for real. So, um, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. You can also add, um, there's, there's something called crackle. There's something, the, 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 there's a whole thing with furniture called distressing. You can make it look old, even though it's new. And um, crackling, what it does is it makes the paint, it, it has a, a glossy finish. And then if you put a paint over top of that that has a much flatter finish, it will separate. And crackle separates into like um, rows and, and little um, distorted areas. You can use crackle finish and then paint over top of that. And then you can even do a glaze over it so that where all the, where all the cracks are, the glaze sinks into the cracks and makes them look more prominent. You can use crackle, you can use um, the metallics. If I were gonna repaint this and paint it navy blue, I would probably do uh, gold accents on it because I could sell it at Local by Design on Main Street in Annapolis for all the navy people, so. <laughs> That's, um, I, I use the metallics quite often. Um, another thing that I'll show you real quick that you can do with glaze. Now this is a, this is an investment. You can get these, these brushes you can get at Lowe's or, you know, some places like, like Michael's. This is called a badger brush. And unfortunately, yes, a badger did have to die for the bristles for this brush. Um, but um, these badger brushes are, are really um, a tool that a decorative, a good decorative painter can't, can't do without. So one thing I'll show you that you can do with a badger brush. I'm going to put on some glaze. And I'm going to wipe some of it off. And what this badger brush does and remember I told you the, the glaze kind of makes the paint float on top. What the badger brush will do is it'll help to move that paint, that glaze just enough so that it blends it. And I'm just using the very tips and you can see what that does. It just sort of makes it look watery and blended. I do this a lot. I use these badger brushes for wood graining and for marbling. But that just sort of blends it so it gives you a real, a real, um, you know, very indistinct lines. Um, it kind of blends all the lines and everything together. So that, that's another tool. That, and you can get these for around $20 at Lowe's. So they're really nice if you wanted to do a really 
specialty finish, maybe you wanted to do something, a little nightstand or something, that this would be a really nice thing to use for that. And this is one brush that I never, never, never let paint dry in. <laughs> So, all right, questions, comments? You can go ahead and unmute so we can hear each other. Very impressive, Deb. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's so interesting. Hi, uh, Deb. Uh -huh. you represent you recommended a germs putty uh, for furniture. How is that spelled? I couldn't read it. I think it's behind you. Yep. D-U-R-H-A-M-S. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you just mix it with water until it's about the consistency of peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And um, and just, you know, just use a putty knife to apply it. Um, and then you just let it dry completely and, and it sands really nicely. And just make sure when you're sanding it that you're using a very fine grit sandpaper, maybe 400 grit. Uh -huh. so that you're not getting marks in it after you sand it. Could you spell it again, please, Tom? Sure. D U R. D is in boy. Yeah. D U R. D as in dog. U R H A M as in Mary S. Durham. Like North Carolina. Yeah, like Durham, North Carolina. Oh. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but it's made in Des Moines, Iowa. So. Oh. <laughs> I guess somebody named Durham must have, but he must have come up with it. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Now, if I were going to do, um, I'll, I'll just speak to this real quickly because I know at least one person out there is considering doing kitchen cabinets. If I were going to um, do kitchen cabinets, if I were just going to paint them just to refresh them, I would first clean them with simple green. Make sure I get all the grease off. The other thing that I often use to, to degrease kitchen cabinets is called TSP substitute. Um, trisodium phosphate was the original product, but that's, you know, we, phosphates are not good to use anymore. So this is a substitute, so it's not the real thing. But um, the trisodium phosphate you mix with water and that's a really good degreaser, but simple green works really well. And then I would use uh, this paint deglosser um, to clean it. And this one, let's see. This one is the one that you do have to wipe off after. Yeah, after surface has been deglossed, you have to wipe it off with a damp cloth. So you have to do an extra step with this. But this paint deglosser will prepare your, um, your surface really well it'll make it nice and dull so that it'll adhere whatever you use will adhere over it if i were going to do um, cabinets that have been previously wood colored i would definitely prime them first so you want to make sure that you use a good primer there's one called xim that's really good and uh, it's called a bonding primer so it it adheres really well and it gives you a nice uh, even surface to uh, to put paint over Oh, the other thing I didn't talk about, I'll, I'll say real quick, is uh, top coats. If you were going to do a glaze on, on a table or whatever, just like I did on top of this, I can't just leave that like that because it'll scratch off. So I have to use a top coat on it. Um, always look for, do not, do not use Minwax, um, their, their acrylic um, Urethane. Well, yeah, it's a polyurethane. Do not use that, the, the acrylic poly water-based that, because that, that will yellow in time. So whatever you put it over is going to, in time, is going to have a yellow tint to it. Always look for something that says um, crystal clear, um, which means that it won't yellow. Verathane makes one. This is uh, it's called Ultimate Polyurethane Water Base. I only use water-based products. The oil-based products, the oil-based urethanes and that sort of thing are only meant for wood. They are not meant to go over paint. So don't use any of those over paint. Um, Valspar also makes one called a Clear Protector. Um, I use a professional grade um, top coat on all mine that's actually made for furniture, but these are, these are a couple that are readily available. Uh, you can get 
the Valspar and you can get the bare thing at, at some of the big box stores. So uh, make sure that you use a good top coat. The other two things that I need to mention, before you put any kind of glaze or decorative finish or anything on top of a painted surface that you've done, make, it, let, make sure you let it dry for at least 24 hours. It has to cure before you can do anything else to it. The same thing with the glaze. Make sure that you let your glazes dry for at least 24 hours before you put a top coat on them because these top coats have ammonia in them and the ammonia will reactivate the glaze um, if, you don't, if you don't let that cure completely before you top coat it. And also when you're top coating over glaze, um, do not over brush it. The more you brush it, the more you're gonna activate that glaze again. So you just wanna make sure that you do the strokes that I showed you where you go one direction and back the other direction. You don't wanna go back and forth because you'll just be digging into the, the glaze and you'll ruin it. So. I think that's all I had to talk about. Let me look at my notes and make sure. <laughs> Yeah, another thing, another thing that I that I didn't mention, um, I, I sort of mentioned it, but I didn't show you, is the distressing. And most people, when they consider distressing, it's usually done with the chalk paint. Now this is um, this is that um, the fusion mineral paint, but you can distress this easily as well. And distressing is usually just like taking a little bit of the paint off here and there. Uh, you can scratch it, you can you know, bang it with a hammer, you can do all sorts of things. But a lot of times so you'll just um, like do around the edges. And this is 320 grit sandpaper, it's my favorite. You'll see this a lot on um, furniture that's like this Habersham piece. You know, you see it, the distressing a lot. You'll see it in our house and, and stores like that. But I'm just taking just a little bit off of the edge and it just gives it a little bit more character. There's very fine edge there. It's hard to see, I'm sure on the camera, but if I just went around the edges and I don't want to do it completely, I want to kind of skip here and there. And, um, and it, just, it just adds a little bit of character to it if you want it to distress something. That's how you would go about it. And I think that's everything I had to talk about. Questions? Oh, and uh, one more thing, top coats. When you're using a top coat, always thin a water-based top coat, always thin it about 10% with water. It'll give you a much, much more brushability uh, and it, it will make it a lot easier to go on and it won't get, um, and it'll, it'll level more nicely. So I always thin my top coats about 10% with water. So I think that's all I had to talk about. If anybody has any questions? You're muted. Thank you. So interesting. Very. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Now I can't hear you. You're muted. Okay, I'm mute. Um, okay. After you lacquer it and you, you finish it, can you put um, items on the table? Um, I'd let say it, I'd, it, I'm sorry? After you, after you top coat something, you want to make yes. sure that it's completely cured. It takes about a week for something to cure enough so that you could set oh. something on it without leaving a mark. Okay, a week. Okay, thank you so much. It's so interesting and fun. Yeah. yeah. It's been really good, Deb. Thanks a lot. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, indeed. Bye. Very yeah, if, if, you, if you're ever in the middle of a project and you need any advice, feel free to email or call. I'm always available to help out. Thank you very much. All Thank right. Well, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.